So we compare peer-to-peer -peer systems against client server systems. <coughs> We're a client server system, as you know, we have a server, a centralized server, and the clients use that server to access resources. <coughs> Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer system, all the, you can think the clients, the end user computers, uh, share their resources amongst each other. What are some of the practical benefits of sharing amongst the clients as opposed to relying on a central server? <coughs> we can distribute storage across the clients, across the peers. So, for example, if we're talking about storing files, in a client server system, the server stores all the files. The clients access those files from the server. So the storage is all done at the server. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, we can think that the peers, the end-user computers, store the files. So the files are distributed amongst all the peers. So you have generally much larger storage space available. Because a single server, if that does all the storage, versus hundreds of thousands of clients which are providing the storage, then those hundreds of thousands of clients, the sum of the storage can be much larger than a single server. So by distributing storage of files across multiple computers, we can get more storage space. <coughs> In a similar way that we can instead of relying on transferring files from an individual server where we have performance bottlenecks, that is, we rely on the bandwidth going to that server uh, that will impact upon our data transfer performance. If information is shared on multiple different peers, then the rate at which we can transfer that depends upon the bandwidth available at multiple different peers not on a single server. So instead of having one bottleneck in our network, because we can access resources at multiple different locations, we can avoid such a bottleneck. An example is that instead of having to download from one server and thousands of people downloading from one server, those thousands of people can download from multiple different peers. So distributing the load across the network. And another thing that peer-to-peer -peer systems can uh, allow in some cases is using the knowledge from the different peers to help uh, solve some problem. One example, and we will not go into any more detail, is a, think of a, a social network or having end users to be able to perform some classification. So in a client service system, there's some central entity that, say, classi classifies information, sorts out information. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, each of the users has a role in classifying that information. It's potentially you can classify the information much, much better if you rely on many more users. Something like Wikipedia. The idea is that many different users are contributing information to this system as opposed to a centralized system where we have just one source that's contributing information, we can have a potentially much larger uh, amount of information if we have all peers involved. We're going to focus mainly on storage and, and some aspects of bandwidth. What we want to do is look at some general mechanisms for which a peer-to-peer -peer system can be built. There are different ways to classify peer-to-peer -peer systems. There are peer-to-peer -peer applications, software you download and install, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, protocols for exchanging packets to achieve some, the, to get some peer-to-peer -peer system to work, so to support some peer-to-peer -peer applications, and algorithms. So there's a mix. Uh, when someone says a peer-to-peer -peer system, it may refer to any of those things. we're going to focus on some general protocol mechanisms. So some examples of peer-to-peer -peer applications you may have heard of, Nutella, Napster, BitTorrent is another one. Uh, 
there are peer-to-peer -peer platforms or uh, software architectures that allow you to develop applications. There are different algorithms that are used for searching in peer-to-peer -peer systems. We're going to look at some of those general algorithms or protocols that a peer-to-peer system, peer -peer system can be built upon. Go back to a client and server system. You want to download a file using a client server system. The server stores all the files. You want to down, so the server stores a list of a thousand different files. You as a client want to download one of those files. To find that file, all you have to do is contact the server and say, do you have this file? And if the server has the file, you can download from that server. <clears throat> Finding a resource in a client server system is very easy because the server has those resources. So to, to find that resource, the file is the resource, you simply contact the server. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, we distribute the resources, for example, the files, amongst many different computers. So there's an additional challenge of how do you find those resources. So resource location is a, a main challenge in peer-to-peer -peer systems. So we'll generally talk about a resource. The best example is a file, but it doesn't have to be a file. It can be, the resource can be some compute capability, some capability of computer to perform some operations. In a centralized network, to find a resource, you go direct to the server. But in a peer-to-peer -peer network, those resources are spread around different computers. So how do you find it? Let's introduce some notation. And we'll use that to describe some different algorithms for finding resources. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, we can say we have a group of peers. Think of them as computers to spread across the internet, for example. A group of peers, G is the group. Each peer has some address. In the internet, that address may be an IP address, maybe a port number for the application. So each peer can be identified. So we'll use the notation P. And I use an underscore to indicate the, the peer ID. And those peers store resources. For example, think of resources being files. And we can identify those resources by some unique key. You may think initially of a, as a file name. So we have a set of computers in the internet. They want to share files then we need some unique identifier for those files. A file name may be a unique identifier, but in fact, you can have two different files with the same file name. So in fact, file names are not unique in many cases. Another way to get a unique identifier for a file is to take a hash value of the file. We'll talk about that if we need it later, but assume that each resource can have a unique key an identifier. <clears throat> so we have peers, resources and keys. Peers store resources. Resources are identified by keys. So the goal for resource location is you're looking for a particular resource. Assuming you know the key for that resource, then, then, then the challenge becomes if you know the key for some resource, you need to find the peer that stores that resource. Remember, in a peer-to-peer -peer system, when we're distributing resources amongst peers, it's, the resources are not on an individual server they're on could be on one of many different peers let's give a simple example <clears throat> simple peer to peer system four peers p1 p2 p3 p4 four computers on the internet i call them p1 to p4 
they could be identified by some IP address, some port number. But four computers anywhere on the internet, not in the same LAN, anywhere on the internet. They store some files. And instead of writing the file names, I'll just say resource R1, some file. P4 has some files, R1 and R3. P3 stores some files. R1. R1, R4, P1 has R2, and P2 has R3. So here we have four peers. Each of them stores some resources. <coughs> Each resource has a key, and the notation we'll use is that resource R1 has a corresponding key, K1. R3, K3, and so on. Same subscript. Now, Peer 1 is, wants to find a resource. They have some key, K3, where the key is a unique identifier for that resource they want. They have a key, and now their challenge is find out which peer in this network has that resource. So P1 is looking for the resource identified by key K3. So resource location is we need some algorithm such that P1 can find out that in this case, either P2 or P4 have the resource. That's the objective of resource location. Find which peers have that resource. Once you find them, then you can contact them and download that resource or access that resource. Now, if we think of the resources as files and the keys as, to keep it simple, file names, then you can think, okay, P1 wants to find some file, K3. They know the file name. They want to download this file. Therefore, they need to find the peers that store that file. And we'll go through, through different approaches for doing that. So that's the, the resource location problem. And it involves using some form of an index, where an index maps keys to peers. An index of this system could be K1, is available at P4 and P3. K2 at, which means really resource R2, is at P1. K3, meaning resource R3, is at P4 and P2. And do we have another one? K4 at P3, P3. That would be an example of an index in this case. It tells us where those resources are located based upon the key. <clears throat> so if we know this index, then when peer P1 is searching for the resource identified by K3, then it's quite simple. Look up the index. K3, look, K3 is at P4 and P2. So if we know the index, resource location is easy. But the problem is, how do we know this index? How do, how do we know that K3 is at P4 and P2? And where do we store this index? In a peer-to-peer -peer system, one of our potential advantages is we distribute the functionality across many different computers. We don't have a central server that stores this index, at least in some systems. So if we want to distribute this, then 
we may store some of the index on different peers. We may store the entire index duplicated on each peer, or in fact store no index information on any peers. We'll see some different approaches. So our goal is to be able to locate resources. We've just introduced some terminology at the moment. Normally a peer will not store the entire index because all right, in our network it's not a problem. But now imagine a network with 1,000 different peers spread across the internet. The index will change over time. The set of resources available will change over time. A new file becomes available a new peer becomes available, the index changes. Trying to update the index on 1,000 different locations so that it's a consistent index is very challenging. So often a peer will not store the entire index, but maybe a portion of that index. And since they do not store the entire index, they may have to send a request to locate resources from their neighbors. So if P1 did not have this index, it may have to send a request to other peers saying, where is K3? If they store the index, then they can send the answer, K3 is at P2 and P4. So the index may be distributed amongst different peers. <clears throat> For this to work, we need some way to allow peers to enter the network and to leave the network, to join and leave a group. That is, to know about the other peers in the network. For example, if P1 is going to send a request to another peer, which one? Again, think of these four computers as four random computers in the internet. They're not in your same LAN, uh, four computers in the internet. For you to join this peer-to-peer -peer network, you need to know some of those existing peers in the network. So there needs to be some way to join a group. And once you join some peer-to-peer -peer system, join the group, you need a way to be able to search, given a key, find a resource, or find the peer storing that resource, and also insert new resources and delete old resources. That is, if resource R3 is no longer available at P2, then from the network, we need to delete that resource. Somehow update the index so that this entry disappears. So think we have resources. We need to be able to find them, add new resources, remove old resources, and manage the group. <coughs> How do we do those things? How do we manage the set of peers in a group? Well, there are four peers in our peer-to-peer -peer network. New node comes along, P5. It wants to join the group. It wants to join this network. What does it do? It needs to know an existing member of the group. To join this group, it needs to know the address of one of the existing four members. How does it know that? Well, either the addresses of these are published somewhere, we'll see some specific approaches, there's maybe some other special server that keeps track of those peers in the network. But somehow it needs to know the address of at least one other peer. And then once it knows one other peer, it sends a generic message to that peer saying, I want to join the, the network, and assuming that's accepted, then that new peer exchanges information with existing peers. So P5 may send a, a message to P2 saying, I want to join the network. If that's acceptable, then P2 may tell P5 about some of the other peers in the network, about the peers that it knows about. So as a node wants to join the peer-to-peer -peer network, it needs to learn about other peers in the network. 
Similarly, if a no wants to le leave a group, it normally will tell the other, another peer, I'm leaving the group. And those other peers can update, for example, their index information or other information to keep track of who's in the group and who's not. The, the main three operations for data is search, insert, and delete. Search is, think of, we take some input key, it should return the address or the set of peers that have that resource corresponding to, to that key. So search, if P1 performs a search for K3, <coughs> that should return what values? If P1 searches for K3, it should return P4 in this case. Because peer P4 stores the resource R3, which is identified by K3, key K3. The difference between the resource and the key is the resource is the actual a file. The key is just an, a short identifier of that file. So that's the idea of search. We need some algorithm to do that in the network, some algorithm and protocol. Insert is given a new resource and its corresponding key, add that resource to the peer-to-peer -peer network. And depending upon the system, that can be done in different ways. We'll see that when we go through different examples. And delete is remove some resource with a particular key from the network. How do we implement these functions? Different approaches for doing it. We're going to go through, I think, three basic approaches. And then you'll see how search, insert, and delete make, or how they work in different approaches. The different approaches can be classified in different ways. One of them is called is whether the approach is structured or unstructured. In an unstructured approach, there's no information about the resources kept on other peers. In an unstructured approach, peers do not store index information. In a structured approach, some peers store information about what other peers store. So if this index was stored on all five peers, which approach do we have? Structured or unstructured? Common exam question. The index that I've drawn on the board, if it's stored on all five peers, is this a structured or unstructured approach? It's structured because there's some peers storing information about other peers. So the difference is that a structured approach, peer, for example, peer 2, stores some information about what peer 1, 3, 4, and 5 have. So if we store this index on P2, P2 knows something about the other peers. That's a structured approach. Unstructured is when a peer knows nothing about what other peers store. We'll see some examples of that. Flat versus hierarchical. A flat peer-to-peer -peer system, all nodes are the same. Hierarchical, some nodes have special functionality. Let's go through three three different approaches and see this in play. We'll go through Napster, Nutella, and another one called Fast Track. On these slides, there's a little bit of history and where they, were, where they come from. They were three uh, originally popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocols. So Napster was mainly probably the most popular one, or the first most first popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application. We're not going to talk too much about how it was used. We're going to focus on the technology behind it. 
and what the protocol was or the basic architecture for discovering resources in the network. Same with the others. We will not go on so much about how they used, but go direct to how, how they worked and then compare them after. And I'm going to do it on the board. We don't have any pictures here. We're going to go through the examples on the board. Napster was a directory-based architecture. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system in some senses, but in other cases, it's considered a client-server system. So it's a mix, in fact. How it works is that there's some central server which is used to locate resources, in particular to store an index. Then the clients that want to find resources contact the central server. And then once they find the address of the peers that store the resources, then the clients contact those other peers directly. So think in the context of downloading a file. In a pure client server system, you contact the server and download the file from that server. In Napster, what we have is a server, some clients, I'll call them peers, So we have a special server, and we have our set of clients or peers in this case, the end user computers. And let's say these peers again have resources. I don't know if it's the same as over there, but we'll make up some values. So these are computers, they have a set of resources. We want to make those resources available to the other peers in the network. How do we do it with Napster? Well, essentially, the server stores an index of these, these resources. So what happens is that a peer, when it wants to join the network, contacts this server. So it needs to know the address of the server. So that's a well-known address, an IP address, a port number, for example. The peer contacts the server with a join message. We want to join the network. And the peer tells the server its own address, its peer identifier, and the resources that it has. And the server stores an index. And as we said, it stores, for a particular key, the location where that resource is at. So, K2, P1. That is, the resource identified by key K2 is stored at P1. So when P1 joined the network, it would contact the server and join, and inform, so I will not draw it, but would send a join message. I want to join the network. And then send an insert message Maybe do not draw it or make some space because I'll delete it in a moment. But insert, and what we saw with insert, we have a new resource, R2, identified by key K2. This is really the peer telling the server saying, I have resource R2, identified by key K2, and it's stored at P1. Therefore, the server updates its index saying K2 is available via P1. So there's some message sent from peer to server informing of this resources available. And each peer that joins the network does the same. They join by contacting the server and then inform the server which resources they have available. And over time, as peers join the network, the server index is updated. So after these four peers have joined, we'd have K4 is at P2, K2, P3, 
K3 at P3, K1 at P4. So each peer informs the server of the resources it has available. And the server maintains an index. This is not peer-to-peer. -peer. This is like a normal client server system. Think of a normal server where you download files from. The, that server stores an index of the files. It saw, stores, okay, the file name, except the, in the index of a pure client server system, the file is actually stored on the server. So where Napster is a peer-to-peer -peer system is that the resources, the files, are not stored on the server, they're stored on the peers. So a peer joins by contacting the server, inserts their resources by telling the server what resources they have, the server maintains an index. Now, a peer comes along and they want, P4 wants to find a resource. So what they do is they send a query to the server, a search query, searching for K4. P4 wants to find the resource identified by K4. Think of K4, say, as a file name or a unique identifier of a file. And they send a query to the server. And quite simply, the server looks up in the index. K4, look in the index. K4 is available at P2. Server sends back a response, some answer. doesn't matter whether it's called answer, what the type of message is called. The idea is that it tells the peer that that, that resource is available, available at P2. And then P4 contacts P2. Some request. And if it... If this resource is a file, they download the file. So that protocol for contacting and downloading the file depends upon uh, what the application implements. It could, be, it could be simply a HTTP request and response, some file transfer protocol. So once you learn the address of the peer that has the resource, then you contact that resource, that contact that peer and access the resource. If it's a file, you download it. If, it's, if the resource is the ability to do some computations, then you access that peer and tell it to do some computations. So the peer-to-peer -peer part here is the distribution of the files amongst the peers and the contact directly between peers to get the files. The server just stores the index. It doesn't store the actual files. So we join the network by telling the server or contacting the server. We insert resources by contacting the server. Similar, we delete resources. If P1 no longer has R2, it sends a delete message to the server. The server simply updates the index. And to search, we send a query to the server, and the server responds with the peer that has that resource. And then we contact that peer directly. So that's the basics of Napster. And Napster, in its original form, was very successful because it was used for for end users to download files, to share files. So the end users have files on their computers, on their hard drive. The Napster server keeps an index of which end users have which files. So to find another file, you contact the Napster server, and that will tell you where to download the file from. But because most of the files were copyrighted, it was illegal to do so, to provide at least that service. So that's where Napster was shut down. 
because providing the server to locate the copyrighted material was deemed illegal in that case. So this is a mix between a peer-to-peer -peer system in that we're accessing the peers directly to access the files, but we still rely on a central server for the index. If the server fails, the entire system will not work because we can no longer search. So that's a problem in this case. It's a direct, we say it's a directory base. The directory, this, this server stores a directory of the, the files or the resources, an index. It's very efficient for searching. To find a resource, we send one query to the server and immediately get an answer because the server has that entire index. So very efficient for searching. But it's not so good for fault tolerance. What does fault tolerance mean? The ability to, to handle something going wrong, in particular at the server. If the server fails, the entire system fails. The system will not tolerate a fault at the server. If P2 fail, fails, the, the computer is not working, then the system will still work. It's just that the resources on P2 will no longer be available. But assuming those resources are replicated across other peers, we can still locate them. Scalability, because every request goes to the server, there's an extra load on that server. And as the number of peers grows, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, then all the requests are going to one central server and it, performance becomes a problem. So that's another issue. Let's look at a different approach, Nutella. This is almost the other end of the spectrum. That is, it is uh, almost completely opposite in the different approaches we have available. We have a set of peers. Oh, let's draw some to get started. And just to make the example a bit better, we'll have a few more peers. What do we got? P6, P7. That should be enough. E9. We have some peers, they have resources. Let's distribute some resources. Doesn't matter so much. So we have a set of peers, they have some resources available on, on them. In Nutella, we have a completely distributed system. There's no central server. It's an unstructured system in that we, do not, we will not have a single index. In fact, the nodes will be quite simple in terms of what they store. It's a flat architecture in that all the nodes are treated the same. Napster is a hierarchical architecture in that we have a server which has a special role and then we have the normal peers. So there are different types of nodes, server and peers. In Nutella, everything's just a peer. Ignore loosely coupled. We're not going to try and explain that. Before we go into those details, let's use the board to illustrate what happens. Now we have nine peers spread across the internet. Where I've drawn them doesn't equate to uh, a geographical location, just nine computers somewhere in the internet. When 
e each peer needs to know about some other peers. So when the network starts, there's one peer. When a second peer wants to join the network, it needs to know that other peer. As more peers join the network, they need to know about some of those existing peers. So we can talk about the peers that we know about as a set of neighbors. So to get started, let's say that these nine peers know about some of the other peers in the network. They have some neighbors. And I'll draw them by just drawing some lines to connect them. That is, peer one has two neighbors, two and three. And I'll just connect some of them together. Each peer needs to know about some other peers in the network, and we'll call those other peers neighbors. These are not links, not physical links, but you can think of them as conceptual links. That is, P1 knows the IP address of P3 and P2. So it can send a message direct to P3 and direct to P2. And similar, P3 knows the address of 4, 1, and 7. Normally, the set of neighbors that each peer knows is, is quite small. 2, 3, 4, maybe a few more. Consider a network with thousands, even millions of peers. Still, you only have a handful of neighbors, three, four, five neighbors. If a new node wants to join the network, P10 arrives, then it needs to contact one of the existing peers. So it needs to learn the address of one of the existing peers. Say, somehow it discovers the address of P1. And so how? How does it discover the address of P1? Either it's advertised somewhere, that is, the computer has found it from some web page, or there's some, again, some special server that stores the address of selected peers. But a new peer needs to know at least one existing peer to join the network. Let's say it knows P1, then it sends a special message to P1 saying, I want to join the network. And those messages in Nutella are called ping and pong messages. You send a ping message. A new peer contacts an existing peer using a ping message. This is the, the join procedure. With Napster, we said that we send a join message to the server. Here, they, in Nutella, they have some specific names. How do we know that existing peer? How do P10 know, P, know the address of P1? There may be some dedicated servers that list known peers. So we contact one of them. And then, P1 responds with a Pong message. And inside that message, P1 tells P10 something about its neighbors. So P1 tells P10, my neighbors are 3 and 2. As a result, P10 now knows about P1, 3, and 2 in the network. So it's a way to learn about other peers in the network. And then that, that response may include other information, not just IP addresses of the peers, but information about files available. Then P10, of the peers that it learns about, selects some of them to be its neighbors. So P1 doesn't have to be a neighbor of P10. This initial ping pong message is just to learn about some other peers. So currently 10 knows about 1, 2, and 3. Let's say it selects 1 and 3 to be neighbors. So they would send a message and join the network. So as a result, P10 will have two neighbors, peer 1 and peer 3. In this case, it selected two neighbors. 
the number of neighbours it selects, usually again a small number. Uh, sometimes the response from P1 may be more than just uh, the neighbours it has, but also other nodes that it knows about. So that was just the process of a new node joining the network. It needs to establish connections with existing peers. If something goes wrong and an existing peer leaves the network, P3 leaves the network, then there's procedures for P10 to find some more neighbours. Usually you need uh, multiple neighbours for the system to work well. Now how do we search for, for resources? Let's say P10 wants to find a resource K try K3 first. Yeah, K3 will work. Peer 10 wants to find resource K3 identified by K3. That is resource 3, R3. So they want to find that resource and access the resource, so therefore they need to find the peer that stores that resource. What do they do? There's no index stored in any of the peers. The approach that they use is essentially broadcast a message through the entire network. They send a query first to all of its neighbours, and those neighbours will send to their neighbours, and they'll keep going until they find the peer that has that resource. So P10 sends a query to its two neighbours saying I'm looking for K3. Of course they don't have K3 in this case. P3 has resource 1 and 4, P1 has resource 2. So those peers, P1 and P3, send the queries to their neighbours. P1 will send to 2 and 3. Do not send back to who's just sent you the message. P3 sends to 1, 4 and 7. It may not send to 1, depending on whether it just received the, the query from P1. And what happens next? Do we find the resource? P2 will receive the query. It doesn't have R3. It will send to its neighbour. At about the same time, P7 receives a query. It will send to its neighbour. P4 receives the query. P4 has resource R3. We were looking for resource R3, K3. So we've found it, and now we send back a response saying, the resource R3 is available at P4. So send a response indicating where is the resource and then similar to this approach we can download or access that resource directly. So the search approach, uh, search approach in this case is to use a method of flooding. We send a message through the entire network, one peer to its neighbours, those neighbours to their neighbours and so on until of course the resources found, then a response is sent back. How many responses to, does P10 receive? How many responses does P10 receive? it receives two because there are two peers that store that resource. It will receive a response from P4 and from P8. It only needs one. I mean two is okay but in theory it, it's looking for a single response. But of course P8 and P7 don't know that P4 responded. So they still receive the query and send back a response. P8 doesn't have to send the query on any further. 
So P7 sends the query to P8, P8 sends a response, P8 doesn't have to send the query on any further. So the query wouldn't go to P6 or P9, but it would go to P4, uh, it would go to P5, and two responses will come back. So that's the basics of Nutella. It's a fully distributed system. There's no server. There's no index. Or in fact, if we think of an index, the only index is local to each peer. P2 knows that R6 is at P2. P2 doesn't know anything about what other peers store. So this is our unstructured approach. The peers do not know about what's stored at other peers. Whereas in Napster, the server knows what's stored at other nodes. So that's a structured approach in Napster, an unstructured approach here. Napster is a hierarchical approach. We have different types of nodes, a server and the, the peers. Nutella is a fully distributed approach, a flat approach. All peers are treated the same. There's one exception. We may have a special server that stores the address of selection of peers so that when a new node joins the network, it can discover the address and contact an initial peer. So they're almost at two different endpoints of the set of design solutions for peer-to-peer -peer systems. A centralized approach, except for the contacting of the, between peers, and a fully distributed approach where there's no central entity. Which one's better? Napster and Nutella. Napster. Why? One time answer. Okay. Search is efficient here. To search for a resource, a peer sends a query to the server, we get an immediate response because the server has an index of all resources. So a response comes back and we know the other peer. Search is very efficient. We send one search query, get one response. In the teller to search, we effectively send a query to the entire network. We broadcast to everyone in the peer-to-peer -peer network. We send it to our neighbors, they send to their neighbors, and so on. And we get multiple responses. So we need to send many messages through the network to get our response when we search. So Napster is better in terms of search. We say more efficient. It's faster, less overhead. Nutella is not good for search because it takes time to get a response. And we need to send many messages through the network to get a response. What's good about Nutella then? If, if P4 fails, system will still work. Because, okay, the resources on P4, of course, will not be available. But the resources on all of the others will be available. And the search will still work. Because... We'll get the query to P5, we'll get the query to these other nodes, even if one of these nodes fail. If our server fails in Napster, the entire system fails. So that's a, a significant difference there. Of course, if a peer fails in Napster, not a problem. But the server is, is the central point of failure. I think most people have seen flooding before. They understand the concept of flooding, and that's what's used in the query here. We send a message through the entire network. We flood the network with a query. And it's very inefficient, but tolerates faults. It's very simple as well. There are some other details, there are many details of how that works and ways to optimize, to reduce the number of messages sent. That is, instead of sending to all of your neighbors, send to just a selection of your neighbors to reduce the number of messages sent. 
or to put a, a time to live on the message so it doesn't go forever through the network. But we will not touch upon them. I think that's just the, that's the main point that you need to capture, those, what we've covered on the board. So the, the points about firewalls and the list of peers are not, not so important. Try and capture the concepts we're de demonstrating on the board. So there's two options for peer-to-peer -peer networks. Can we go better? What can we do different? Hmm? Again? Mix them. Easy. This is... Napster has the advantage of sufficient or oh, efficient search it's very good for searching very fast Nutella has this advantage of if one node fails the system keeps working so let's try and mix them together and see if we can get it, both of those advantages and that's what fast track does it's a combination of these two schemes it has and we'll show it on the board, but it has, think of, there's multiple servers. So it uses in some parts a central server, but in some parts, the other parts, it uses the, the Napster flooding approach, send a message to everyone. So it's a hierarchical system in that there are different types of nodes, and it has what's called a super peer architecture. We have our normal peers, and the special peers, which are called super peers. Let's try and draw it on the board. I'm going to draw a set of nodes, and the SP means a super peer. But initially think these are just, in this case, 12, 17 different computers in the internet. Just because I've drawn them next to each other doesn't necessarily mean they are physically next to each other. This P4 may be here in Thailand. SP2 may be in the US. So although I draw them next to each other, that's just in the, the conceptual relationships between them. They may not be physically near each other. So there are a set of peers. We'll distinguish between the normal peers, P, and super peers. Just other computers in the network. And each peer joins the network by contacting a super peer. So, for example, P4, when it wants to join the network, it needs to know the address of one of the super peers. Uh, yeah, one of the super peers. Similar in Nutella, when P10 joins the network, it needs to know the address of another peer. Where does it get the address from? In fast track or a super peer architecture? P4 joins the network, it needs to know the address of a super peer. Where does it get that from? The server. And what's the name of that server? Some special server here. A super, super peer. So we need, as with all of these approaches, we need some special server that 
stores the addresses of some of the nodes. In this case, this super super peer stores the addresses of some of the super peers. Oops. In Nutella, we needed a special server. I didn't draw it, but that knew the addresses of some of the peers. So that when P2 came along, it contacted this special server, said, tell me the address of some peers, and that special, special server sent back P1. And therefore, P10 sent a ping message to P1. In Fast Track, it's similar. When a new peer wants to join the network, it contacts the super super peer, this special server, which knows the address of some of the super peers and responds and saying, OK, here's the address of SP2. And then P4 contacts SP2 and joins the network via SP2. So there's this process of joining the network. And it's the same process in, as in Napster. When P1 joins the network, it contacts the server and tells the server what resources it has. And I haven't drawn the resources yet, so let's draw some. Just distribute some resources randomly amongst the peers. Resource. Doesn't matter so much, just some resources stored on some of the peers. And each peer knows about one super peer. So when P4 joined the network, it found the address of super peer 2 and joined via super peer 2. Similar to Napster, where each peer knows about the server. Except in Napster, there's just one server. And all the peers contact that one server. In fast track, or in general a super peer architecture, there are multiple servers or super peers. So we can say these lines indicate that the peers have joined via the corresponding super peer. And when they join, they then insert their resources into the network. In the same way with Napster. Each peer tells the server which resources they store. P1 told the server it had R2. So the server maintained an index at P1, or K2 is available at P1. K4 is available at P2, and so on. Same approach here. Each peer tells the super peer about the resources it has. So that super peer maintains an index. So super peer 3 would have K6 is at P7, K2 is at P8, resource 6 and 2 at peers 7 and 8, and same with the other super peers, that each have an index. Let's try and draw it. So that's a similar approach to what happens in Napster. But it's local between the peers and just their super peer. So these indexes are stored on the super peers. That's the, the process of inserting a resource. We tell the super peer which resources we have. Now, we want to search for a resource. Let's say P4 is looking for, we'll do different searches. K1, what does it do? 
is looking for K1. What do you think is going to happen? Where is P4 going to send the query to? To its super peer, SP2. Okay. So we think it's the same approach as in Napster. You send it to your local server. So send the query to SP2. SP2 looks in its index, searching for K1. SP2 has it in its index. K1 is available at P6. Send back a reply. The resource, so the query is sent, the reply is sent back. The resource is available at P6. And then P, P4 contacts P6 directly and accesses that resource. So that's the exact same approach as in Napster. Send a query to the server. Server looks in the index. If it's found, send back the answer. And then the peer, peer contacts the corresponding peer. So that's easy. Try another one. Search. So that worked. Fine. What if we search for K? What have we got? Three. P4 is searching for K3. It sends the query to the super peer again. The super peer doesn't have K3 in its index, so it doesn't know where K3 is. So what does super peer 2 do? It uses Nutella, or the same concept, and it contacts, it sends a query to other super peers. So the super peers also have I'll try a different color, know about other super peers. The blue lines indicate relationships or connections between super peers in the same manner as Nutella, where one peer had connections with its neighbors. In fast track, super peer 2 has two neighbors, SP1, SP3. How did they discover it? The same way as in Nutella, some ping pong, some exchange message to, do, to contact neighbors. So when a query comes to SP2 and it doesn't have an answer in its local index, it then sends the query in the Nutella style of flooding it through the network of super peers. It sends the query to its two neighbors. What happens? SP2 sends the query searching for K3 to SP1 and SP3. No, this is the query. The ping pong is just the joining part for Nutella, when you want to contact and, and find a neighbor. Once we've got neighbors, which these blue lines indicate, this is the query sending a search. then simply those super peers look in their local index. SP1 sees we're searching for K3. OK, I have that in my index. Answer is P3. Send back a reply, P3. Send the reply to SP2. SP2 can then send it to P4, and P4 knows K3 is available at P3, because R, resource R3. The search query goes in the other path as well, and in fact, I think it will eventually, it will go to SP3, SP3 will send to its neighbors, SP5 will receive and send back the answer P11, because the same resource is available also at P11, and send back a response. So it's a combination of both approaches. Between peers and super peers, we use the centralized Napster approach. If we find the resource via the, the same set of peers, via that super peer, we get a quick response. Searching for K1, immediate response. If we don't, then the super peers communicate with each other using the Nutella distributed approach by flooding a message through the network of super peers until 
And then we may receive multiple responses back, and eventually we discover those peers that store the resource. It's hierarchical. We have different types of nodes, peers, super peers. Yes, it's, it's small local instances of the Napster approach and then connected at the top level between the super peers using the Nutella approach. So the blue part is using Nutella or a similar protocol. The black parts are using the Napster approach. And it's trying to take advantage of the, the fast search in Napster, send a query, if that resource is available via the super peer, we get a fast response. If not, then we need to flood. And the advantage is we don't have to flood through all the peers in the network. In Nutella, we flood through the entire network. If we have 100,000 peers, that's a lot of messages that need to be sent. But with fast track or this super peer architecture, let's say now we have 100,000 nodes, maybe 1,000 are super peers, the rest are normal peers. So flooding is only done by between the super peers, much smaller overhead there. And what if SP4 fails? If a super peer fails, the network can still work. Because at least if SP4 fails, then we lose access to P9, P10, and SP4. But we can still access the other, other super peers. So even if a super peer fails, we can still contact the rest of the network. So we lose some of the network if one node fails, but not the entire network, as in Napster. So it's a trade-off between the two extreme approaches. They are the three, the three general approaches. They, they were used in specific systems, Napster, Nutella, and Fast Track. But the concepts uh, apply to different systems as well, and the main different approaches. There's a fourth approach. I don't think we're going to get a chance to cover it this, this semester. Maybe if we have time next week, but I doubt it. Uh, so they're the main approaches for how can we structure a peer-to-peer -peer network and the concepts. The challenge is locating resources. Resources are now distributed amongst the peers. They're not on one central server. So how do we know which peer has the file? Well, we need some resource location system. We either have an index on the server, like the Napster approach. We have a fully distributed approach where we flood the network with a query to find the resource, or we somehow combine them in this fast-track approach or a super-peer architecture. Once, once we find the peer that has the resource, we then want to download that resource. If it's a file, we'd like to download it, transfer it. In large networks, many peers will have the same resource. For example, we search for K3, P3 and P11 have that same resource. In a larger network, there may be tens of hundreds of peers which have the same resource. What we'll cover next week is a way to download that file from multiple peers at the same time. So instead of just downloading from one peer, try and take advantage of the fact that multiple peers have the same resource and download parts from one peer, other parts of the file from another peer to try to spread the load across the network. So we'll go into that approach, which is using BitTorrent next week.